thank you everyone for allowing me to talk to you this evening and this afternoon. Um, I, this is a really fun topic to get to talk about because um, one, I am a super nerd and I love Apache Cassandra and databases and technology in general. And I really enjoy getting to speak about um, this particular topic and just about databases in general. So I'm really happy to get to share this with you. And, and I, I want this to be very interactive. So if we do have questions, please do post them uh, in the Q&A. And if there are some questions that are coming up, then um, you know we'll try to address them because I, I want you guys to be able to um, get that hands-on experience, get, get some experience working directly with Apache Cassandra and utilizing some of these machine learning tools and algorithms uh, just right on top of Apache Cassandra. Um, today we'll be using kind of a, a technology stack that is, it's pretty lightweight, but it's also, you'll see it's very powerful. We're gonna use, um, we're gonna use Jupyter, which is a very common um, Python-based notebook. Uh, we're gonna use Apache Spark, and we're going to use DataStax Astra, which is um, our data or our Cassandra as a service product. So it's hosted, and so you uh, and it's a no ops thing. You can spin up a, a Cassandra cluster very quickly and get started working on it. So um, I'll show this. Uh, this is the GitHub repo that the link is there in the chat, and hopefully you've received it or been able to look at it. Um, there are a couple of downloads if you haven't had a chance. To do that, really, it's just the free registration for the DataStax Astra database, which you can go ahead and spin up. Um, you can follow the instructions. We'll kind of step through it a little bit as well. And then um, some way to clone this repository like GitHub or like Git and then Docker and Docker Compose. Um, so let's get started. First off, I want to thank Mike Waldrop and Anthony Menendez who are on the, uh, on the chat and on the call with me today. Um, you know, everybody be super nice because my boss, Michael, is on the line and, uh, you know, give me some good reviews or something like that. So he's impressed. Um, Anthony uh, covers the Latin America region for data stacks and I help him out as a data architect. Um, all right, so let's jump into it. I wanted to talk a little bit about Cassandra itself and give you an overview um, of the technology, the distributed database that is Apache Cassandra. Um, so that you can have an understanding uh, of what we're working with. So let me go ahead and step through it. Apache Cassandra is a NoSQL distributed database. Um, so what does that mean, right? So uh, it is a database that is made up of instances of Cassandra, like we call them a node. One node, generally speaking, uh, has a, about a terabyte to a terabyte and a half of capacity. You know, the throughput at, at 3,000 transactions per second of course, that all depends on the size of the transaction and things of that nature, but it's kind of one of those, you know, put your finger up in the air and kind of guess at it, right? But, um, but each one of the instances can be added to a, what we call a cluster. So all of the nodes together can make up a cluster and they all talk to each other through a communication mechanism called gossip. Um, and so the, and then one data center, one logical data center, we call a ring. Um, and within an entire cluster of um, data stacks nodes, you can have multiple data centers. And we'll get into a little bit about why that's important here in a second. Um, Apache Cassandra scales linearly. So if you need more data capacity, or if you need more throughput, you simply add nodes to the cluster. Um, a little bit about horizontal, horizontal versus vertical scaling, right? Vertical scaling means if I need more throughput or I need more capacity, I have to buy a bigger server. I have to add more RAM. Um, horizontal scaling in this instance means if we need more transactions per second, we simply add more nodes. And it allows us to be able to build these clusters on um, you know, more commodity style hardware rather than having to get a huge machine in order to meet the transactions per second or the SLA or the, the um, uh, sizing requirements for data storage. So in a Cassandra cluster, the data is distributed around the ring, around the cluster itself to each one of the nodes. So um, you can see that my little pretend table over on the right there the data gets distributed by the partition key. So the partition key in this case is the country and the data gets 
um, placed around the ring itself based on the partition key. You can see that it's kind of grouping the, um, the data in logically or reasonably the same place. So data is also, we make a, a very strong attempt at uh, distributing the data evenly. Now there are cases where you can kind of get a little off balance, but what we do is we take that partition key and we run it through a hashing function. And each one of the nodes itself is uh, assigned a range, uh, a token range in that hash. Um, the Cassandra cluster looks at the hash of the partition key and says, oh, well you get to go to node three because your partition key is hashed, the hash value is this. So a little bit about how the token ring works itself. Um, and this is kind of the, this is what I like to think of as the, the magic of Apache Cassandra, right? This is, is such an interesting and cool thing to get to, to think about and look at about how this data gets moved around um, the, the nodes themselves and distributed across um, you know, multiple data centers and multiple nodes that can sometimes span the entire globe, but be one logical database. And it is, it's so fascinating to me to watch this. So I, I like talking about it. Um, so your data comes in and the uh, hashed value of your partition key is 59. And I'm absolutely making up all these numbers because it is some huge, like two to the 63rd power number that you know this hashing algorithm uses that spreads data around but for to make it a little easier 59 is the value for the hash and so the data comes in from your application and it talks your application can speak to a coordinator node now one thing that i forgot to mention is that apache cassandra is a completely masterless architecture um, there's no master and slave nodes so any one of these any one of the nodes in the Apache Cassandra ring can take a request from your application, from your client. So the data comes into the coordinator node and the coordinator node says, oh, you need to go over here because this replica node is assigned the token range that has 59 in it. So we're done. Now, one of the things that is also important uh, in Apache Cassandra is the replication factor. So uh, data gets replicated around the ring so that in the case of a node failure or if we have a, um, some sort of an outage or a network partition or something like that, you have multiple copies of your data throughout the ring for uh, high availability. So at replication factor two, which means when you write data, it gets replicated twice. Your data comes in, its value is 59. It comes to the coordinator node and the coordinator node says you get to go to these two nodes right over here. It's that, it, you know, it's that simple, but it's, it can be very complex, but it's broken down. It's that simple. You have two copies of your data now and they live on these two nodes. Now replication factor three, which is generally speaking where we like to recommend um, that our users set the replication factor. Um, data comes in to the coordinator node, hits the three nodes that are assigned to this particular range and there you have it. Now, in the case of a node failure, hopefully one of them doesn't catch on fire, but if it does, your data comes in as a write and you send it to two of the three nodes that are supposed to receive the data and um, data gets stored on the, on the uh, coordinator node as a hint. And that's just what we call a, an undelivered replica at this point in time. The, the, coordinator node will hold on to that data until the node comes back online and then it'll send it across. The node failure is recovered for whatever reason that somebody put the fire out in the data center and now we're okay and the data is delivered to the replica that it needs. Now I spoke a little bit about um, Apache Cassandra and data centers. So the, the entire cluster itself can consist of multiple data centers and your data centers can be spread around the globe. It can be distributed um, you know, in multiple data centers in multiple countries. Your data can be replicated um, from data center to data center in milliseconds. Um, and Apache Cassandra is designed purpose-built for hybrid cloud and multi-cloud environments, which means 
you can span an on-premise data center and one of the major cloud vendors. You can span both cloud vendors, all three cloud vendors, on-prem plus a couple different cloud vendors, however you need it to be. Um, this is how Apache Cassandra is designed to work. Um, I don't want to get too deep into this, but Cap Theorem, you know, one of the uh, kind of a, a database um, theory, uh, this is where Cassandra sits, right? Um, between availability and partition tolerance. But um, what we like to call Cassandra is a tunable consistency database, which means if you need more consistency, you can tune it. You can set your consistency level by query. So if you need very, very high consistency, you can do it. So um, the consistency level within Cassandra uh, can be set both on the read and the write. So the client comes into the coordinator node, if you see over on the right over there, the consistency level, CL is one, which just sim simply means the coordinator node is going to send the query to all three nodes and the first one to reply, we have now finished the read request. Um, consistency level quorum, quorum just simply means half plus one. So in the case of replication factor three, uh, we, we need two because we've got to round up um, to a whole number. So we get a response back from two of the three replica nodes that say, hey, here's the data. And now we have finished the read um, or the write. Now consistency level all is exactly what it sounds like. Um, you need to have a response from all three of the replicas before you can complete the read or the write operation. Now, if you, again, we're talking about tunable consistency here. So you can have, um, you know, if you need very, very fast throughput, you can have a lower consistency level. If you need immediate consistency, um, it simply means the, that the read and the write consistency level need to be greater than the replication factor. And I know that that is kind of a, a math problem, but essentially if, you're, if you need very strong guarantees, Cassandra can do that. If you need very, very fast throughput, Cassandra can also do that. So I know I have gone very, very quickly through uh, an overview of Apache Cassandra. Um, uh, I'll very quickly go over to this. Um, Cassandra's data structure is tabular-ish by nature. Um, tables are organized in rows and columns uh, with logically on disk, they are grouped together in related rows called partitions. Um, you can see here that the, the table has rows and columns, the partitions being X, Y, and Z. Uh, as, a, as an example, kind of more of real life, the table uh, there, the city name being the partition. So we want to group together all the people that live in a particular city. So the city is the partition, and then the rows are all of the people who live in that particular city. And that very simply, that is kind of how the partition would work. You want to partition your data by like logical groups. Um, clustering columns are the um, are what will give each row its uniqueness. So each person's unique name will allow it to keep the data in that particular partition, but um, continually fill in rows as you write them. Step through this. Okay. So I wanted to pause for just a second because I know I sped through that, um, but I wanted to give you a, at least a bit of an overview of what Apache Cassandra was at, as a distributed database. I don't see any questions um, in the chat or anything like that. Um, hasta ahorita no hay preguntas, ¿verdad? Um, no, we don't have any questions for now. Okay, good deal. ¿Tiene alguna pregunta? La puede hacer ahí. All right. Let me step through this really quickly. I wanted to give you a bit of an overview on uh, Astra, which is kind of a, a uh, Cassandra, uh, is a database as a service, which we have built on top of Apache Cassandra. Um, we want to be able to extend the number of important operations which we can, can perform without thinking about them. I love this quote. Um, and as it relates to databases as a service, Cassandra is uh, sometimes can be uh, 
especially if you're going to manage a very large cluster, there are a lot of ways that you can tune it. There are a lot of different knobs that you can turn. We want to provide you with a database as a service built upon the power of Apache Cassandra that is easy to spin up and can you can get started on it very, very quickly. So we have designed Datastax Astra, which is a Cassandra as a service cloud native database um, allows you the no operations experience. There's a free tier. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time talking through this, but it is very uh, has a strong security compliance. We have gone through many many rounds of testing with this uh, with this product, so we are very proud of it. I am proud to be able to show it to you today. So thank you very much again for letting me kind of build this upon um, uh, Astra, and I think that you're going to enjoy getting to, to use it here today. Um, there are ways that, that you can um, migrate data from an existing database to, uh, to Astra. We are going to be using two of them today, uh, DS Bulk, which is a really, really fun tool that can load data into Apache Cassandra or Datastax Astra very, very quickly. You're going to see that here in just a second. Um, our strategy is to build um, a hybrid database as a service, whether you are using open source Apache Cassandra, whether you are using Datastax Astra, whether you are using our um, enterprise uh, Apache Cassandra, which is called Datastax Enterprise, we want to be there for you with your Apache Cassandra deployments. Um, so this is, uh, we love the Cassandra community. We love being able to build tools and help our users, our developers, our enterprises succeed with Apache Cassandra because it is a very, very powerful tool for building these modern cloud native applications. So now we get to some of the fun stuff. Hopefully you guys have um, been able to sign up for the free tier of Datastax Astra and um, so I'm gonna flip over the window here. This is my Astra database. So uh, if we, I'm gonna pause for just a second and maybe if you guys can put in the chat, like if, give me some thumbs up or plus ones or say, hey, and let me know, like, have we been able to spin up a few? Um, all right, good. I'm seeing some people say it. Um, spin up a few instances of Astra here. Um, one of the things I want to do is step through the, we have a built-in exercise with our developer studio, which is kind of notebook based like, um, like Zeppelin or Jupiter would be. So um, there's a, a launch now button right under your uh, connection details uh, on your Astra page. And that will open a new window that looks like this, sorry. Um, and I want you to just click on the getting started with Astra notebook. <clears throat> and I'm gonna let that load up here for just a second. And then let's, let's take a few minutes and step through this. Um, what this is gonna do is it will allow you to build um, like five tables and load a few thousand rows of data and then query the data. So I'll go through you can read through this if you like, but essentially we're going to get down to this cell here and begin to um, create our tables, which if you hit the run button here, this is where you can execute each one of these cells, right? So um, you can step through and create these tables um, and then loading data is a little bit farther down. You can see that this is going to look very similar to, you know, other database languages that you have seen. And then once you've created those tables and inserted some data, your select statements are down here in some where clauses. So I'm going to give you all a few minutes to kind of start working with this notebook. Um, and I'll be available for questions. Um, Mike and Anthony are available for questions as well. So if you take a couple of minutes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say seven or eight minutes and start stepping through this and let me know if you guys have any questions.
Um, James, could you go back to the screen where you launched the notebook? Absolutely. Yeah, so that's this screen here and then this launch now button. So Carlos, I can answer your question. Um, the This screen here, so if you went to astro.datastacks.com and signed in, it, it logged me in automatically. But if you, if you either set up an account or logged in, you would get to this page here. And then you just click on your database which will get you here to the connection details and then launch now for your developer studio. Yeah, so after, after you launch the Getting Started Notebook, you can just begin, you really, you can just work from the top all the way down. Um, this does give you some information on how to set up a table, how to create one, what these tables are doing, the type of data that goes into these tables. And then once you get down here, you can just simply run each one of the cells, uh, each one of these cells in sequence. You, you do need to start at the top and kind of keep working down. Um, and then you will, uh, and then you will kind of get down to the bottom and you can see some data actually come back. Um, Adolfo, uh, local quorum trace trace in, um, in Cassandra is kind of like a, uh, will allow you to kind of see a step-by-step -step of how the command got executed in, uh, Cassandra. Local quorum is the consistency level. And if you add trace to it, you, it'll, it'll kind of print out all of the different, um, yeah, print out all of the different steps that it went through to go and uh, do the query. James, I think a few people just missed the step of creating the table when they went into Astra. So. Oh, I see. Okay. About that. Yeah, there's a short key on um, on mine. It's uh, is it Shift Enter? Hang on. Now I'm. I say that I know what it is, but here, let me do this. Yeah. Uh, so for me on a Mac, it's uh, shift enter, Carlos, for a short key for running and going into the next cell. Now you'll have, so everyone will have access to your Astra database. I, I forget, I apologize, I forget for how long, um, but it's, I've had mine running for a good long while now. So you, if we, if we move along and you haven't had a chance to finish this notebook, you'll have it and you can continue to play around with it as, uh, as much as you like. So I'm gonna keep stepping through this here. I know that everybody is uh, enjoying the working from home environment. I, you can probably all hear my two-year-old yelling for, for mom. Right now. Well, 
We'll take a couple more minutes and I'll just kind of get down to some of the select statements here. <laughs> yeah, it can get pretty loud around here sometimes. Carlos, it's similar to SQL. You're not going to see, yes, exactly, Mike. Yeah, CQL is what it's called. Let's see, the journey catalog is one that I opened here. So I'm going to run this select statement here select journey ID from spacecraft journey catalog, where spacecraft name is Apollo 11. And there's one. All right, how's everybody doing? We getting getting close to ready to move on? Excellent. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, um, part of the exercise today is going to be around Apache Spark. Now, Apache Spark has a wealth of machine learning uh, libraries that are associated with it. So we are going to be using Spark um, and Jupyter and a few different Spark machine learning libraries to run some of these algorithms tonight. Um, so, as a way of review, um, we'll talk a little bit about Apache Spark and uh, why it is so powerful for utilizing both for machine learning and in conjunction with Apache Cassandra. Um, now, data analytics are uh, it, even uh, almost a field, not even almost, a field of scientific study. It can even be uh, around taking data and finding patterns and gathering enough information to be able to provide um, either uh, business information or the ability to take the next be best action on your data itself. Some of the ways that we see our, uh, our enterprises and users using data analytics on Apache Spark are in the form of recommendations engines, fraud detection, um, social network mining, customer 360 applications, um, IoT analytics, things of that nature. And there um, are many, many steps uh, that are uh, in, utilized in data analytics. So we're gonna step through this uh, a little bit uh, after the Apache Spark overview. Um, a distributed computation engine. So you're going to hear this. Uh, you're going to hear this distributed. Uh, you're going to hear this distributed word a little bit uh, when I talk about both Spark and Cassandra, right? So they are both distributed systems that allow you to to spread out the workload, um, both for um, on the analytics side and on the um, database side. So this is something that is, they both go very, very well together. Um, so <laughs> a bit of an eye chart, right? But uh, essentially Spark does have a master and workers. And when your Spark program is executed, it is sent to the master and then that the master distributes that workload to the different executors. Essentially, I, I'm not going to go into all the steps here because I, I want to get to the fun stuff. Um, this is really interesting when you start thinking about um, Spark and Apache Cassandra or Spark and Datastax Enterprise together. Because um, now outside of the um, outside of the open source Apache Cassandra, in the Datastax Enterprise, we actually have the both the Spark masters and workers and the Cassandra nodes living in the same JVM. And I'll uh, talk about that here in just a second. I know I'm kind of glossing over that a little bit, but 
um, the database access with the, the, what we call the Spark Cassandra connector, which is a open source driver that we have to talk either between Datastax Astra, Datastax Enterprise, or open source Cassandra to Spark. Um, implemented mostly in Scala. So do we have any Scala fans? I love Scala so much. Um, I don't know if anybody else does, but I love programming in Scala. Um, mostly in Scala, but we, there uh, are obviously ways that you can uh, talk to Spark in many different programming languages, Python and Java being two of the other ones. Um, anyway, so uh, I talked a little bit about both Cassandra and Spark being distributed systems. Um, I will briefly say that one of my favorite things about Datastax Enterprise, and I mentioned the Cassandra and Spark living in the same JVM, is that when we go and distribute the workload, when the Spark master sends the jobs, you know, sh shuffles data around or goes to look for um, executors to run on, it will utilize the Cassandra nodes that, that have the data living on them so that it reduces the amount of data that has to shuffle around over network hops. So it, it tries to be smart about where it's going to distribute the computational work Spark does. Um, so this, I, this is one of my favorite features and, and again, it has to do with the token ring and where Spark distributes the work. It tries to be very, very smart about it. Um, and so we see a lot of our customers using DSE analytics and spark, um, for their machine learning algorithms, just simply because you get, you can achieve uh, a much greater performance when you're running these algorithms. All right. Um, I love this quote and, and this is, um, uh, again, just a very, by way of review and a quick overview here. This is the Wikipedia definition of machine learning. And if you don't know anything about machine learning and you try to go to Wikipedia to learn about it, you're just going to get confused. So this is the definition that I really like a lot better. Machine learning is the science of drawing circles and colorizing them because it, it just simply uh, is a, a fun and interesting way of, you know, graphing out data and finding the ways that all of this data can relate to one another. So even if you still don't know anything about machine learning, this is at least a shorter definition of machine learning. Um, you have a data set, you, by way of, um, you know, trying to determine which algorithm is the best for, best fit for this data and for the problem you are trying to solve, you try to arrive at a decision. Um, again, use cases very similar to Apache Spark, uh, forecasting, aberration detection, classification, recommendations, all sorts of use cases here. Um, just a handful of different algorithms, and there are more and more that are being uh, instituted here all the time. Um, supervised and unsupervised machine learning right? Uh, supervised machine learning data is, is either already labeled or you can somehow generally classify it. Um, unsupervised machine learning, right? Data is not labeled and you are trying to find, um, you are trying to find the uh, classifications or the groupings of data um, by utilizing these unsupervised learning algorithms. All right. Again, we talked about your data set, choosing an algorithm, and attempting to arrive at a decision. The learning, the machine learning workflow, generally speaking, is begins with the question that you are trying to answer. What you know, where are the logical groupings in my set of data? Um, one of the things we're going to look at this evening is the um, the number of likes associated with a social media post, right? So, what, how do how do my social media posts group together based on the number of likes and comments that they receive? Um, selecting an algorithm comes next. Preparing and trying to uh, correlate your data as much as possible. Splitting it um, into a training set and a testing set. And then just simply tuning your algorithm and tuning your tuning your input, um, simply repeating these processes until you have fully trained your model, um, and then arriving at the answer. 
Where machine learning uh, on Apache Cassandra comes into play, um, Cassandra can store heterogeneous data and you can use Cassandra as part of a streaming infrastructure. Um, it is very, very useful when uh, you are looking to ingest high volumes of data. We, we see Apache Cassandra being used in many use cases, one of them being like a, an IoT style, Internet of Things style, where you're getting sensor data or you're capturing click streams or social media feeds and you want to be continually running uh, these algorithms over incoming data. Um, you can see, and I won't read this entire slide to you, but you can see how Apache Cassandra can be used uh, effectively across these machine learning algorithms for, for many of the things that I've talked about already. So again, we're keep going here. So this is enough talking, right? You don't, you didn't come to this workshop to hear me talk. You wanted to get to play with the database, right? So let's go. What are we going to use? Know your tools. Know your, if you're going to survive a zombie apocalypse, you need to have the right tools. Just like if you're going to use machine learning algorithms, you need to have the right tools. We're going to use Spark. We've talked about it. We're going to use Cassandra in the form of Cassandra as a service, uh, data, data stacks Astra. We're going to use Jupyter. We've already looked at data stacks developer studio and we're going to use Python here because it is a pretty quick, way to get into these machine learning algorithms by way of the uh, the spark machine learning uh, the spark machine learning libraries and then these additional python libraries pandas pyspark numpy and scikit-learn which will allow us to visualize our information as we uh, as we run through the algorithms we're going to try to get to all five of these um, Pedro, how are we doing on time, right? We're, where do we go to? We're all the way to what time? We're all the way to 7.15. We have one more hour. Okay, all right, we're gonna get through it. We can do it, guys. But I mean, there's not another workshop or session after that. So if we run a bit more over that, it's not bad, but I just okay. respect the time of everybody, but we're not, we don't have like a hard uh, cut time. All right, so we're going to use K-Means, Naive Bayes, Random Forest, FP Growth, and Collaborative Filtering this evening. So, whoa, all right, there we go. Let's get started. Again, I, I kind of mentioned earlier, um, supervised and unsupervised. K-Means is an unsupervised algorithm that can logically cluster uh, data into X number of mean centers of, of, uh, of clusters of data. Um, I'm not going to read this slide to you, but hopefully you guys are at least familiar with some of these algorithms. I didn't necessarily want to spend a whole lot of time talking about the algorithms themselves, but stepping through how to use them with Spark and Cassandra. So um, if you need more information or you're looking for more information on some of these algorithms, we can help you guys find it. Um, so let's talk about um, all right, good. I'm going to come back to here. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to spin up our Jupyter notebooks, make sure that we have the connection set to Astra, and then we'll start stepping through it. All right, so I'm going to jump around, hopefully uh, not too much here, but this is the GitHub repo that hopefully you guys have been able to clone. Um, now let's make sure that you have Docker running. Um, on my Mac, it's this little icon here. And let's go ahead and spin this thing up. So the installation instructions here, uh, I've already cloned the repo because I wrote it, you know, but this is my little terminal here. So you guys are gonna watch me type live. I always love that. Um, So now I am here in the root of my repo, right? And I'm just going to run docker compose up dash D. Now, if you haven't run this yet, if you've just cloned the repo and you run docker compose up, um, it will pull the Docker images 
from Docker Hub. And it'll go ahead and build it. So this may take you a minute if you haven't already done this. So if, if you're seeing something different than what you're seeing on my screen, you're probably seeing it start to, to pull the Docker images and things like that. So depending on your internet connection, it could take a couple of minutes. Um, so if you guys maybe in the chat, could you give me a you know thumbs up or a yes, we got it, or we're seeing it download. Hopefully everybody's okay with this. Nice. <clears throat> All right. So what this will do, once it finishes downloading, it's got to build it, it's got to do all that fun stuff. Once you kind of get it all set up and up and running, you can come back over to a web browser. Now for me, I just need to type localhost and it comes right in. And I forgot to mention, so I've, I've done this before. It may ask you for a password. The password is data stacks, lowercase, all lowercase. And this is your Jupyter instance that is running on your machine. Yeah, there you go. Thanks, Mike. And what did I say we were going to do first? K-means. So, all right. Now the next thing that we need to do is we need to download the Secure Connect bundle. So I'm back on my Astra database page here. And close to where we launched Developer Studio, you see um, authentication here and download Secure Connect bundle. So I'm gonna go ahead and click that and it's gonna download a zip file. Don't unzip it, leave it just like it is. Now, and I'm gonna, Sorry for all the jumping around here. So you can see that it downloaded. So I can get to that. Adolfo, um, Jupyter is uh, included in that Docker image. So when you, when you ran Docker Compose up and it downloaded from the internet and actually pulled one of Jupyter's Docker images. And so it has Jupyter and Spark in that Docker image in the, in the container. So you can see it downloaded here, my zip file, and I want to put it, this is my uh, repo, Machine Learning Workshop Astra Online, in the Jupyter directory, and then under Secure Connect, add your Secure Connect bundle here. And you, again, don't, you don't need to unzip it or anything, you just need to move it right to the directory that's called Secure Connect. And now we're back over to our Jupyter notebook here. And I'm gonna look at the k-means notebook. Now again, you guys have you guys have this uh, you guys have this repo now. So if if we begin to work through it and you don't have enough time or you want to continue to play around with it, this is this is yours to use now. Um, and you'll have your Astra database to um, to use with it. So again, this is a notebook kind of like uh, Developer Studio was. Um, for me, shift enter will uh, execute the cell. So we need to start at the top and go through uh, and go through each one of the cells in order. So I'm just gonna start here and I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to a point and then I'm gonna let you kind of run with it and I'll answer questions as we go along. So I'm gonna go through our import statements. I'm importing pandas. This Cassandra here is our uh, data stacks, um, uh, our data stacks Python driver, PySpark, um, you know, some of our other, uh, our k-means uh, from the Spark ML library. This is just to help us format our data frames. Now, here we are. Missing the libraries, how do I get them? Carlos, you should, it should pull everything in once you, yeah, yes. Uh, 
All right, so where we are right here is asterisk credential, credentials and key space. So what you want to do here is instead of username, you fill out the username and I'm going to jump really quickly back to my Astra database page here. This is my username for my database. It's just James. Where am I at? My password is super secret. My file name with extension. like this, my key space name is betterbots because I was doing, we have a, a demo that you can run on Astra that you can build yourself in um, Node, Node.js since I was doing that, that's why it's betterbots. Um, so I'm gonna run that and what it's gonna do is it's gonna store these variables now. They're gonna get used throughout the rest of all of the notebooks. That's why we started with this one. This, this uh, is a little handy Jupyter uh, command here. The store will store these variables and then they can be used across all of our notebooks. So right here is where we're gonna to connect to Cassandra via the Python driver. And then it's gonna set the key space. And then this will create your table. And this here is essentially a success. If you don't get a stack trace or anything like that, you're good to go. Um, and we are loading, what we're gonna do is load a bunch of social media data um, in this data set. And included in the repo are some big CSV files that we are gonna load into Astra and then we'll run these machine learning algorithms on them. So these columns represent the status ID for, uh, and you heard me earlier talk about a clustering column, uh, sorry, a partition key. So this is the partition key. This is the unique identifier for each status. And then the number of reactions that receive, comments, shares, likes, so on and so forth. Now, what we're gonna do, I mentioned uh, that we're gonna use DS bulk to run the load of the data. And what DS bulk does is it can take a CSV file, it can take all sorts of different files um, and load them into Apache Cassandra or Astra or DataStax Enterprise. Um, so I'm gonna run this cell and it is going to, um, the, and this is essentially, it's going to run a, a bash command in the Docker container. The Docker container comes complete with DS bulk and it's going to go ahead and load it for you. So I'm going to, I'm going to give it a couple of minutes and let you guys get to this point. And once everybody starts to get to the point of, um, having loaded some data, hit me in the chat room and just say you're good. Yeah, it can, it's, it can take a long time to pull the Docker image if it had, you haven't done so already. I apologize. And you see a couple of people getting kernel errors and things like that. Are, are we, um, are we getting past that? Maybe. Cloud config. The path for secure connect bundle, yeah. So, so let me come back here in my terminal, right? So this is my, um, the root of my repo. And then Jupyter secure connect. So for me, it's, there's my, there's my path. Everybody doing okay? I think we're doing all right. So I'm gonna step along here. 
So this cell here is going to set up our Spark session. And you can see that if, you're, if you've built a, a Spark application before, um, this probably looks somewhat familiar, right? You're going to set the app name masters local because this, this Spark instance is running in your Docker container. So this is running right alongside your Jupyter Notebook. And then you have a couple of different configs here. So you're going to tell the Spark Cassandra connector where to find your um, secure connect bundle. So that's filled out for you there. And then the username and password that we set earlier are gonna get filled in on these other two configs here. And you could, if you wanted to, if you needed to build a Python application, let's say to run on Spark, you could simply copy and paste this. Like you could copy and paste this and fill in your own information and this will, this will build your Spark session for you on Astra. And then we are going to read from our social media table that we have created and create a data frame from it. And we are going to count the number of rows that we have. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this. Now this is reading from Datastax Astra, from your database that you set up, down into your Docker container, running a Spark job, essentially, to count the number of rows in your table. Now let's take a look at what this data frame looks like. <clears throat> so you can see the status ID, the number of reactions overall, the number of likes and comments and things of that nature. Now, a couple of things that we need to do here in order to prepare the data for the machine learning algorithm, right? Um, we're gonna need to uh, create some columns that are necessary for this particular type of algorithm um, and fit the, uh, the training model. So that, that is all done. And this is why one of those reasons why I love these libraries because that's like, three lines of code here, and we've done all of that. And you see we've given it, we've given a label here. So this label zero or one, um, we are trying to determine, trying to predetermine a little bit um, what type of a, uh, what type of a post this is. Was it a photo or was it a video? Zero or one. And we're gonna, we're kind of, we're, we're, we're not using k-means exactly as an unsupervised learning algorithm right here. And, and we'll get into that maybe in just a little bit maybe, but um, we're kind of predetermining it here. Uh, what should we be doing in local house notebooks? So that's the, Adolfo, that's the uh, notebook that we're in right now. Um, yep. So we'll take a look at this here. Oops. You can see that these are getting labeled. Videos are ones, photos are zeros. Yeah. So we split it up here. Now let's take a look at this. Um, we're going to use the pandas library to create a scatter plot. Number of likes is on the x-axis. Number of comments is on the Y um, and the color will be the different color dots are photos and videos. And again, like I mentioned, the science of machine learning is simply drawing circles and colorizing them, right? So here we are. Got some interesting outliers here. This photo getting quite a lot of comments while most of them don't, but these videos get tend to get a ton of comments. This one Anyway, can k-means give us the same clustering? So what we're going to, and this is some information if you wanted to learn about the either the vector assembler um, methods or k-means, there are some links throughout these notebooks that give you more information about the, the ML library and the algorithms themselves. But again, we'll just kind of step through these. This is pulling the likes and comments together um, into the features for these, uh, for these different um, social media posts, right? So these features are, are what the algorithm is going to look at with regard to how it tries to cluster the information. So we're gonna try and give the K 
the K means cluster and K means, right? So we're going to try to break it into two clusters and run the algorithm. So here are the features that we created. The cloud config. Um, are you talking about the the zip file, Juan Pablo, or the let's see the the cloud config? I I got from here, the secure connect bundle. I downloaded it and put it into file not found error. Okay. And then we just want to put it into the secure connect directory here as a zip file. So we don't want to unzip it or anything like that. This is the, this is my Maybe path. just verify, verify the path maybe James yeah. to where that secure connect goes. Yep. So this is the path here. <clears throat> this is on my machine. This is the path. And then in the notebook itself, sorry for the scrolling, but I'll jump back up here. So we got some file not found errors. So this is the the path here. This is this is inside your um, Docker container. So that's you're not gonna you're not gonna see this path here, but it is actually the um, yeah. Don't definitely don't expand the zip file. This is it's a path that's inside your Docker container that gets mapped to your local drive. Um, if you're at all curious, it gets mapped to your local drive right here. You can see the relative path here for Jupyter getting mapped into your Docker container. Um, okay. Yep. There we are. I knew it was around here somewhere. Yeah, so this cloud config, secure connect bundle. Yep. So this is the this is the path for the cloud config here. Uh, Jose Juan Reyes posted like a, a solution to the issue that some are having. Okay. Uh, and just shared like his config, um, how it's set up. So um, let's see if that can solve the issues that some may are having. Got it. Oh, I see. Yep. Jorge Luna is still is struggling with that. Uh, apparently, the others have got it working now. Juan Pablo has it working, uh, and it's Jorge is still stuck. Okay. Yeah, we want to make sure that the Secure Connect bundle gets placed in the repo itself under so like this is when i cloned my repo here it's machine learning workshop astra online it's the root then in the jupyter directory and then under the secure connect directory and so you need the you need the full file name including the extension here and then you got to put it here full file name and with the extension and then you got to run this cell. So maybe maybe we're experiencing some trouble here. We got to run this cell for it to save these variables. So you got to make sure that you hit run or you hit shift enter on this cell so it saves these variables out and then try running this cell again. Yeah, that's the thing with these notebooks that you got to start it you got to start it at the top and go in order all the way down. All right, so we've gotten down towards the end here. We've built our little scatter plot just out of the raw data. Um, 
Okay, so we get the predictions here and the training set. Now, what we want to do here is create another scatter plot um, out of the predictions just to see how it compares to our raw data. Um, and you can see that it, it's kind of, it is kind of appropriately pulling things together, but it, it would appear as though, and this is kind of one of those things about machine learning, right? When we talk about the iterative process of machine learning where k-means may struggle in this particular scenario. Now you can, you can run the algorithm over top of the data and it may give you some useful information, but it, this may not be the best algorithm to choose here, right? So um, this is something that is uh, just simply a part of the machine learning process. So um, I'm gonna go ahead, we made it down to the bottom and I'm gonna go ahead and stop Spark here for this. Did anybody have any questions um, uh, on what we've done or is anybody stuck on something? Uh, otherwise I'll kind of keep moving through these notebooks. All right, looking okay at the moment. I'll save it, why not? And I'm gonna, you don't absolutely have to do this, but I'm gonna shut down the k-means. And we'll come back over here. So we talked about k-means a little bit. Naive Bayes, another, um, or a supervised machine learning algorithm. Um, Again, one of those Wikipedia style, but essentially for um, for a uh, naive Bayes in human terms, right? It, it, we're dealing with probability here. So the probability that I pick up a seashell, but I, I don't hold it up to my ear means that I'm probably near the ocean because if I pick up a seashell and I put it up to my ear, I'm trying to hear the ocean and I wouldn't need to do that if I was next to the ocean. So the probability of me picking up a seashell and putting it up to, and not putting it up to my ear means that I'm near the ocean, statistically speaking. I think it's funny. It's one of the guys that I work with that um, helps me with this particular workshop, put this little cartoon together. And I, I think it is a much easier way for me, for, it was me, easier for me to be able to understand it this way. Um, naive Bayes a lot of times gets used in spam detection where we can um, classify, give, give our algorithms some information, train it with um, phrases that are spam and not spam. Um, and so we're labeling the data here and then as a new email comes in, we can run it through Naive Bayes um, and I'm not gonna step through all of this, but the probability that a email that contains, I apologize, uh, easy and money, uh, according to this algorithm, uh, statistically speaking, 76.9%, pretty high chance that this particular email is going to be spam. So let's take this next, um, let's take this next workbook, Naive Bayes here, and I'll let you guys run it. So um, I'm gonna give you a few minutes to run this and please do of course ask questions if you need it, if you're stuck on something, uh, if you need me to go and take a look at um, a particular cell or run through something, uh, happy to do that. Remember, start at the top, execute each one of the cells in order, you should be fine. So we'll take a few minutes to run through this.
So, um, Adolfo, uh, your question about the file not found error, right? Um, if you go back to, yeah, so if you go back to um, the K-means notebook here, and this cell right here, that, uh, that error that you posted, where'd that go? Yeah, so um, the file name with .zip uh, is in the error. That means you need to put your, your new file name here first and then um, execute the cell. Is this real data? Yeah, a lot of this data we actually used from publicly available uh, like training data sets. Now, if anybody, um, if anyone is still having trouble, um, Jorge, I know you you may still be having trouble with the, the kernel error. Um, it might even be easier, like if you wanted to post um, some screenshots in the the day to day Slack that the data stack Slack channel, I can look at those um, here in just a little bit and see. Uh, I may be able to see something pretty quickly uh, about what's going on. So I'm going to go ahead and run DS bulk and load this uh, load this wine data. So this is this is information about different types of wine. So all of the um, you know all the different uh, qualities, the volatile acidity and the alcohol content and sulfates and pH, all of that stuff. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, all of this here. Um, I do, I am getting a couple of errors and I think it's just malformed data. So don't worry about that. Um, so if you get errors on your DS bulk load, I do too. Now, again, we're gonna set up our Spark session. And I, you know, here I am talking. I told you I was gonna let you guys do this. I'm sorry. I'll back off. Oh wow. Um, let's see. Um, answering a couple of questions over in the Slack. Uh, in the general channel and then, okay. Yeah, a couple of people with that same kernel here.
Are we all doing okay? Somebody, I know we're having a couple of trouble with some kernel errors and things like that. Yeah. I just uh, just shared with you a screenshot, James, um, from one of the attendees. Got it. Yeah, I um, I'll go over to Slack channel and take a look at that. So we're getting. It seems like everybody's getting down to the um, down to the end where we're looking at the test set accuracy, right? Yeah, not super great. So maybe there's a different um, maybe there is a different algorithm that we can run that'll provide us with a better accuracy. And again, this is part of it. The iteration of <laughs> the iteration of working through these data sets and testing our hypothesis. Is, uh, has most everyone made it to the, the end of Night Bays? Okay. Excellent. All right. Any any questions um, real quickly before we continue on? Random forest, again, with the Wikipedia definition of random forest. But essentially, random forest um, is a means by which we can use multiple decision trees uh, in an ensemble form and try to gain insight by running these running data through multiple decision trees. Now, one of the problems with um, random forest is that it can tend to be, or just decision trees in general, right, is that it can tend to be overfitted. Um, and so random forest can utilize multiple decision trees uh, in a means to uh, try to allow for a better fit for uh, additional data sets. Ensemble of decision trees, essentially. Um, and again, we'll make these slides available and there are links to um, some of the information, uh, or sorry, there are links in the notebooks to um, some more information about the ML libraries in Spark and the algorithms in general, uh, if you need them. So the random forest notebook here. Again, let's take a couple of minutes and I'll let you guys step through this and I'll see if I can't help out those that are having a kernel problem. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Missions assignment failed for secure file. Interesting. Okay.
Yeah, Jorge, it looks like it is a, I mean, it could be a permissions problem, especially because that runtime error that, that you posted, and I think, Pedro, you were commenting on that too. Um, I hate file permissions because it could be a whole myriad of things. All right, so everybody making their way through the random forest notebook here. Hopefully we're finding some interesting tidbits of information. At the very least. Okay, good, 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 good. Adolfo, that's great. This is the, it's the same. Okay, good. Yeah, getting, getting a little better. This is the same data set. So if you notice, it's the same um, table that uh, the same data that we used last time, same CSV files, just a different algorithm with much better accuracy, at least for this particular data set. Anybody have any questions? Are we starting to get to the end of this one? Everybody, everybody, give me an okay or a yes or a thumbs up in the chat if we're if we're starting to get to the end of this notebook. <laughs> yeah, I'm not I'm not saying that the the wine quality is my personal opinion. I'm just saying this is the data set we're using. <laughs> you guys are great. Thanks for hanging in there. This is a lot of fun. All right. Frequent pattern growth, FP growth. Very much as it sounds, right? I'm not going to read you the Wikipedia article. Uh oh. Yeah, okay. Now, I like this one because I like movies, and especially movies made by Pixar. So do my kids. Can FP growth be used to find which movies to recommend to our users? Is it a good algorithm for a recommendations engine? We see uh, a lot of our uh, clients, a lot of our enterprises building recommendations engines up on top of Apache Cassandra utilizing Spark because it is a fantastic way to um, generate additional revenue, to, to find insights about your users that are using your applications so that you can make their experience better. Um, you know, it is how Netflix knows exactly what movie I want to watch before I watch it. I don't know how they do it, except I do know how they do it. They get it right almost every time. So this is uh, recommendations engines are one of the uh, best use cases for some of these machine learning algorithms. Um, so let's step through it again. Start at the top. Work your way down. I'll step through this entire one because I like it. 
again, similar uh, to the rest of it, we're setting up the, uh, the connection with the Python driver, sending the key space. We're gonna go ahead and create the tables. Both the tables for the movies themselves, so the movie ID, the, the unique identifier, the title of the movie, and then the genres, and then the movie ratings, so um, the, the actual ratings for the movies themselves, as it would sound. Um, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and load up the um, movie ratings table here using DS Bulk. And I switched this up because I, initially I was using um, I was using the Python driver to do the load of the data, um, and you can see this one. You know we're up to thirty six thousand rows, fifty one thousand rows now. It uh, when I started with this thing, I was using the Python driver to do the inserts, and it took like twenty minutes to load you know, the 100,000 or so rows of movies here. And so I realized that that would probably kill a lot of our time and I needed a better solution here. So I, I picked the DS bulk tool that we have there. So 34 seconds to load 100,000 rows uh, from my laptop inside a Docker container to Astra, which is hosted uh, Cassandra as a service in GCP in Google Cloud. So I figured that would much work much better for you guys and myself not having to wait that long. So let's do a count on the rows in the movie table, movie ratings table. And I'm not saying the Python driver is, isn't, um, you know, a good choice for loading data because in an actual application running on a server, you know, but running from my laptop, it wasn't a good choice. But DS bulk worked great, even from inside the Docker container. All right, 100,000 rows there. That's a bit of what the data frame looks like. User ID 170, watched movie ID 126, 21, and 22, gave it these ratings. So we gotta kind of modify the data frame a little bit to uh, better fit the needs of the algorithm. We're just gonna go ahead and filter out movies that are below three because nobody wants to watch those anyway. And then we're gonna take a look at the data here. So this is data that's grouped by user and the movies that they watched. We're gonna need to um, take a look at the, again, the requirements for this algorithm. We need a column uh, that is labeled items. And I can't remember why I put this in here, but number of distinct user IDs, it's interesting to know. Again, um, some information for you all on, um, on this particular algorithm that we're using and the, the PySpark ML library. Um, so let's take a look at this here and look at our recommendations. What is this algorithm going to turn up for us? Come on, little laptop, you can do it. Is everybody doing okay out there? Well, I'm waiting on this to run. It's so interesting. I know we're all having to get used to um, I'm going to get used to this new particular lifestyle, but I, I like giving these presentations in person, right? Because I can see your faces, we can interact. So it's very interesting for me to not be able to see you all, but I know you're out there and having fun with this and I appreciate you sticking with it to the end. All right. So we're going to load up the movie table again, using DS bulk. I think this is a bit of a smaller data set, just different movies. Yeah, 
There we go. All right. So let's start taking a look at our recommendations here. If you like these movies, you'll like some of those other ones, right? This is a this is the basis of a recommendation engine. So for a given user, two movies that you liked as you know a given user number um, based on your ratings are Fargo and Silence of the Lambs. I'm not saying anything. If you like that movie, that's fine. That's it's up to you. But if you liked those movies, you might like Pulp Fiction. There you go. We just used FP Growth on data set, two data sets, movie titles and their genres, and user recommendations uh, and ratings of particular movies. And we built ourselves a little recommendation engine right here in this Jupyter Notebook. So any questions? Everybody kind of get to the end or understand where we're at, where this is going? Thumbs up, high fives, yes. All right, very cool. So we're coming to the final stretch here, right? We just went through FP growth and we're looking at collaborative filtering. Again, this is uh, gets used in social in social networks. Um, basically, anything that is user uh, rating driven. Again, we we're kind of looking at it with user ratings for movies, right? Uh, uh, collaborative filtering can be used for you know user A, B, and C liked this, so user D may like this based on their likes, uh, and it is you guys get it. I'm not going to read you the Wikipedia article on it. Uh oh, I forgot to change the clip art there. Sorry about that. All right, I'm gonna let you guys go through this last one. Collaborative filtering notebook. It's based on jokes. I'm a huge Seinfeld fan. If anybody out there is a fan of Jerry Seinfeld, I really like this. If you like these jokes, maybe you'll like some of these other jokes. Take a run through it. Yeah, I like, uh, I like what Mike said there in the chat. We all just discovered, provisioned, and tested a brand new data platform using several open source machine learning algorithms and saw the results in two hours or so. I love it. Is everybody doing okay out there? We. I'm hoping that at least we were able to get past some of these issues and, and I, I feel for you guys because I worked on these notebooks and I crashed, I crashed these Jupyter notebooks in just about every way that you could imagine crashing a Jupyter notebook. Um, so I, I kind of feel your pain out there, you guys that were having kernel problems. Um, hopefully we'll get past it. But, and as, as I mentioned earlier and as Mike mentioned, the, these materials are yours. So please use them, you know, uh, you guys should have, you'll have the slides, so you'll have my email address if you want to ask questions, things like that. Um, we want you to be able to use these, uh, use this material and learn from it and be able to, to use this knowledge in the future. And uh, Pedro, I know we're starting to, um, yeah, there you go. I know we're starting to, uh, to come up on time here, so I wanna allow maybe a little bit of time at the end if we have any questions or anything like that. So I'm, I'll just kind of step through the end of this notebook here and let everybody finish. Sure, sure, let's do that. Uh, let's take this time to address like more general questions about the, the product or, or other things you can do. Um, I suppose uh, the participants may have questions and yeah, absolutely. Uh, on on the product or the offering. Entonces, uh, vamos a, a, digo, si quieren seguir haciendo los ejercicios, pueden hacerlo. Pero si vamos a tomar estos últimos minutos, por si tienen preguntas sobre el producto, eh, quieren conocer más acerca de Data Stacks y la oferta, para que las puedan eh, hacer. Ahorita aprovechando que, que todavía tenemos aquí a Mike, James y Anthony. 
I have some. Oh, actually, could you talk about the, the certification? And I believe that participants have a voucher to to get themselves certified. Yes. Right? Yes, that's absolutely right. And um, and I believe that we are going to be making available to all of you who have attended today. Um, I don't know by which means it's going to get to you, whether it's email or, or something like that, but we are, we are giving away vouchers to take our data stack certification exam. Um, so normally that costs 300 or so us dollars to do. Um, but we want you guys to get the skills that are necessary to become proficient with Apache Cassandra. Um, that is one of the things that we are very passionate about. We have um, a online course called Data Stacks Academy where you can go and learn about Apache Cassandra, um, both from the developer aspect and from the operator aspect. So there's, there's two certification tracks, developer and operator. You can pick which one you like. Um, we have great videos that are on Data Stacks Academy that will prepare you for the test. So I highly, highly recommend Data Stacks Academy. Um, and again, in this, uh, in the slide deck, we've got links to the training courses and the certifications, uh, uh, as well as some of our other, like we've got podcast. I wish we could do live events that are in person, but you know, we will do developer days and meetups and things of that nature. We, we really, really want you all to be successful with Apache Cassandra and with data stacks and with Astra. Um, cause we think it's very powerful. I, I, I really love the products. I love what we are seeing our users do with Apache Cassandra and with data stacks. Um, so I was really happy to get to talk to you guys about it today. Adrian, that help a little bit? Yes, and uh, okay. we will send uh, you the by email your your codes for the voucher. Okay, and awesome. Instructions on how to redeem them. Perfect. I wanted to mention here um, we do have we we published a couple of O'Reilly books. If you guys are interested, Cassandra: The Definitive Guide and the Practitioner's Guide to Graph Data. Um, these are these titles are in English, and um, we do have them available for you. You can. I think you can even get the digital copy on the data stacks website. So you want to check that out. Um, we've done just very recently, we released a series of, uh, of videos. We, a lot of times we like to do an in-person Cassandra conference annually, but we weren't able to do that. So we turned a lot of the talks into videos so you can catch that on our, on our website. Um, hopefully some, some good information for you all to, to take away. Does anybody have any questions or anything um, we wanted to go over here in the last couple of minutes? Mm -hmm. I did such a good job of explaining it that there are no questions from anyone, right? Is that, that's what it is? <laughs> You got all the way to the bottom. Somebody, Jose, I saw you got to the bottom. I'll be back. How much experience do you recommend we get before applying for certification? So I, I went through both certification tests. And so I would say if you, if you go through the Academy course, um, and, and it'll be pretty obvious when you get there to the Academy website on, on which course you can take either the developer track or the, the operator track. I'd say if you if you go through the course and you make it all the way through and you're able to comprehend and do the exercises, it's meant to prepare you for the exam. And there are there are many ways that you you know you can also use Astra or you can spin up um, you know an open source Cassandra cluster if you want to to be able to um, to be able to talk about uh, sorry to be able to understand more about the inner workings of Cassandra and things like that. And um, is there any expiration on the account that they created at Astra or, or like you know how what? much time do they ha have to be able to continue playing with it? You know, you would think I would know the answer to that question, but I actually don't. We've, we've kind of changed it a couple of times. Uh, Mike, do you happen to know or Anthony? I, I apologize. No, you I don't. Yeah, you can use the free tier and um, you can have one instance in Astra that, that is there for 
uh, I, don't, I don't know, forever, for a long period of time, it may become parked if you don't use it for a while and then you yes. can unpark it. Um, so, uh, but you will always be able to go to Astra in the free tier and create a database to test and work with. Okay. And um, for, for, for Mexico and Latin America, uh, do you provide support directly or through partners or how does that work? Well, that's a really great question. Um, and the answer is both. Um, we do have, uh, we do have support, you know, our own support that is based, we have support engineers that are literally based all the way around the world in, in many different countries so that we can provide support, uh, even 24 by seven if it's necessary. Um, and we also do provide support and, um, and services through partners in some Latin American countries. And maybe Anthony, you know, a little bit more about that than I do about which countries we do. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes, absolutely. We do provide, um, il, uh, I'm going to say it in Spanish, absolutamente proveemos servicio tanto de para servicios profesionales este, a través de nuestra compañía, a través de este, partners. Eh, definitivamente cuando viene siendo servicios de apoyo, eh, os lo ofrecemos este, directamente a través de, de data stacks, como también ofrecemos servicio de apoyo técnico a través de partners. Para lo que viene siendo consultoría y este, servicios de implementación y demás, también ofrecemos ambas opciones. Depende de, del país, definitivamente, pues, pero las opciones existen. Um, we have a question from Osvaldo asking if we have any examples of how Astra is being used in tech companies. Uh, real cases. I mean, I know there are a lot. I suppose you can mention some. If you could also mention, I don't know if you can mention also cases in Latin America, that would be really cool. Yeah, so we do, we have, and Anthony, you help me out here too. Um, jump in over top of you, yes. but it's, yeah, so we do have, we have several use cases in Latin America. Uh, we have a lot of banking presence um, in Brazil. And at, I should have asked you this, like, the, the, go ahead. I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. So uh, in, in regards to Astra, which is Cassandra as a service, this is definitely a new offering, all right? This is, so you had Cassandra open source, and we just developed um, Cassandra as a service that recently came out. Basically, it's, a, it's, a, it's developed in order and it's meant to make it very, not only very intuitive, very easy for you to use, but also intended for companies to be able to deploy in a much more cost-effective way. Mucho más costo efectivo, a nivel de costo propia también viene siendo mucho más atractivo. No tienen que preocuparse por el tema de infraestructura. Prácticamente lo pueden desplegar en lo que viene siendo la nube a través de GCP, a través de, do, de este AWS, eh, multinube. En fin, este, entonces tienes varias opciones. Tienes lo que es Cassandra, versión comunidad. Tienes ahora Astra, que es Cassandra en la nube o Cassandra como servicio. Y tienes la versión de Data Stacks, que viene siendo Data Stacks, la versión empre este, empresarial, ¿no? Entonces so, tenemos tres sabores. Y para los tres tenemos apoyo técnico. O soporte. Ok. Entonces, um. uh -huh. si, si respondí la pregunta, habían este comentado que si teníamos clientes con Astra, lo que había comentado es que era una oferta nueva, Prácticamente lo lanzamos porque entendíamos de que el mercado estaba necesitando y estaba prácticamente pidiendo una solución que se adaptara a las necesidades actuales de las empresas. Y esta solución prácticamente viene siendo la que más, o sea, lo, lo, lo que se entiende viene siendo totalmente lo, lo, lo que se alinea ¿no? con, con la necesidad y con la estrategia de las empresas hoy en día, multinube, eh, este, una solución que se provea como servicio, etc. Perfecto. Eh, no sé si hay otras preguntas. Eh, veo. Um, oh, they're asking us. I don't know if you can see that question. If data stacks 
is uh, certified or accepted or complied in compliance with uh, the Mexican Banking Agency, Comisión Nacional Bancaria de Valores. Um, because of these issues of, of where the data should be stored in the case of banks. And how does that work, Anthony? Uh, do, you, do you know uh, in the case of regulations and on where that sí. needs to be stored? Sí, eso viene siendo más o menos como GDPR, este, eh, es más o menos como lo que se reconoce, ¿no? Como GDPR a nivel global, si más, si, si. So, James, basically something along the lines of GDPR, GDPR how is that we're right. managing, right? It's something along the lines. It's more, you know, they're asking for something specific around Mexico, but it's along the yes. lines of, you know, user privacy, et cetera. That's right. And, and we do, uh, we use uh, both DataSax and Cassandra in banking. Um, GDPR is a, is a, um, the European standard, which is probably very similar to CNBB. Um, and so Cassandra is purpose built to be able to have complete control over your data where it resides. So if you have data centers that are in Mexico and in, in South America and in Europe and the data for Mexico needs to stay in Mexico, then it, you can do that. You can set up your key spaces and tables appropriately so that data will not leave that data center within the, the country's borders. So if if it's something about data locality and from, from a geographic standpoint, Cassandra is very, very capable of doing that. Um, whether we have that specific certification, I'm not exactly sure, but again, a lot of times we, we do um, get these types of certifications. Um, very recently, Astra, we, we've gone through the security certification process um, for security and compliance for use um, in the public sector, like in the federal government within the United States. So it, it's not uh, it's not out of the realm of possibility that we can achieve that certification. Yeah, and I'll add something to that. Um, estimado, en los distintos países también existen regulaciones muy parecidas a las que tienen ustedes en México, eh, diseñadas no para proteger la, la, este, la privacidad de los consumidores o de los clientes, ¿no? Y como bien comenta James, definitivamente la, la, la solución provee para que se cumpla, ¿no? Para que se logre cumplir. Eh, Hay una pregunta que hizo Herbert Viera de Sousa, este, que si existe una versión trial para lo que viene siendo Astra, incluso lo que él estaba este, mostrando, James, lo que estuvo mostrando fue una versión eh, gratuita. Eh, de hecho, provee hasta 10 gigabytes de, de espacio. So, si desean probar Astra, sencillamente entren a, o hagan una búsqueda de data stacks Astra. Yo, de hecho, voy a buscar, les voy a proveer el enlace aquí a través del, de, del chat. Eh, y sencillamente creen una, una cuenta muy, muy intuitivo, sumamente sencillo crear la cuenta. Vieron lo, lo, lo ligero que fue prácticamente desplegar o crear una base de datos. Aquí le voy a crear entonces y le voy a compartir el enlace. Se lo voy a poner aquí en el chat. Perfecto. Por cierto, um, ju just to add a bit uh, on the context of, of the, um, the question with, with certification and all that, and I am sure some of the participants here at the, at the ACE lab know more about this than me, but as I understand, what happens is uh, the, the Comisión Nacional Bancaria de Valores, which is the, the government uh, office that regulates the, the, the financial industry um, originally asked that data had to be in Mexico, data of Mexicans had to be in Mexico. Yes. Then uh, there's a possibility to, to get a permission for that to be in the cloud and that's that certification that they mean. Like if you comply oh, okay. with certain steps, you can put it. But anyway, that's going to change because as I understand, and it is something that most the industry is still figuring out, but as I understand, the new uh, NAFTA, the, the, the new uh, treaty between yeah. US, Mexico and Canada, actually has uh, mentions, uh, basically it voids that requirement. It, it, one of the things it includes is allowing for data from 
Mexican citizens to be stored either in the U.S. or Canada. Canada. So um, that was included specifically, basically for cloud computing scenarios. Got it. Makes sense. Then, este, I mean, pueden entrar en el site, también aprovecho y les, les comento en el site de Datastax, le, le, los exhorto a que vayan a Datastax Academy. Ahí van a encontrar todo tipo de, de las clases, este, van a encontrar todo tipo de material para que puedan capacitarse en los temas de Datastax. También en el canal de Datastax en YouTube. Si van a, a YouTube y buscan el canal, van a encontrar muchísimo material. Eh, el, lo que tendríamos, este, lo, que, lo, lo que comentó James, nosotros llevábamos a cabo lo que era el, el, la conferencia ¿no? anual, pero dado las circunstancias actuales en las que estamos, se, está, se, se hizo o, o se llevó a cabo a nivel virtual. Lo, lo, lo bueno es que está ahora accesible para todos y se hizo tipo serie. So, los invito a que también revisen también muchos casos de uso disponibles y también vamos a estar lanzando una serie de, de, de eventos este, una serie de, de, de digamos este, iniciativas como esta en la región donde seguiremos ¿no? buscando la manera de invertir en el mercado ¿no? este, en los desarrolladores, en la comunidad para que sigamos eh, pues este, capacitándonos ¿no? y mostrándoles ¿no? más sobre la herramienta y sobre las novedades que vamos a seguir este, este, teniendo ¿no? con, con relación a Datastax y Cassandra. Nosotros somos, para hacerle, o darle un poco de contexto, uno de, los, este, uno de los fundadores de lo que viene siendo Apache Cassandra es uno de los fundadores de Datastax. Datastax prácticamente viene siendo la versión empresarial. Nosotros somos los este, contribuyentes, digamos que eh, los más que contribuimos el código abierto de, la, de, de Cassandra, en fin, los expertos de Cassandra, si se puede decir así, para el apoyo técnico, este, etc. Cualquier duda o pregunta que puedan tener en cuanto a, a, al producto de Cassandra, apoyo técnico, este, soporte, lo que necesiten, no duden en contactarnos. Y aquí les voy a pasar mi, mi, mi dato, mi correo electrónico, por si me quieren escribir. Perfecto. Gracias, Anthony. Ahí estamos viendo tu correo. Anthony.menendez.com Ahí estoy a la orden. Perfecto. Bueno, pues muchas gracias a todos. Thank you so much, James. Uh, thank you for... Uh, preparing uh, this uh, quite elaborate uh, workshop. We went through a lot. Uh, <laughs> we did. We did. I mean, for those couple of hours, we actually did lots of things. Yes. Uh, that was pretty amazing. Um, thank you so much. And muchas gracias a todos por, por acompañarnos. Uh, el taller se grabó. Ahorita eh, vamos a descargar la grabación y se las tenemos en aproximadamente 10 días. Les podemos enviar la grabación. Los slides, uh, las diapositivas se las enviaremos antes de, fi de este fin de semana. Esta semana les mandamos los slides. So, uh, James, can you get a chance, please, uh, send me uh, the, the PDF, PDF so that we can so share the, the slides. I'll do it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all Mike. very much. Thank you, Anthony. Gracias a todos. Buenas noches.